Welcome to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Manning, and I'm the Rat King. Joining me is Liz, the Rat Knight. I will slay the Rat Dragon and marry the Rat Princess. And we have a special guest this month. Hailing from Parts Unknown, one of the first people to ever loan me a Discworld book, Rachel. Hi all, I am the Rat Whisperer. They tell me all your secrets. <laughs> um, you are most likely to know me from a blog I ran for about five years on Tumblr called Why Animals Do the Thing. Um, I'm also found on other corners of the internet, generally always yelling about various things about animals. <laughs> so we're very excited to have you here for a book that is very much about animals, The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents. Just based off the title... I didn't entirely know what to expect from this, but it seemed kind of like I was imagining more of a magician and Maurice would be the magician. But once I like physically got the book, I was like, OK, I get it. This is probably for a slightly younger audience. And I was definitely not expecting Maurice to be the cat. <laughs> Yeah, me either. I don't think I'd read this book before, although I'd read most of Pratchett. And so coming into it, I was expecting something like a crossover between the Mouse Circus from, from Coraline and something with the sewers in Ockmorepork. So I was totally off base <laughs> um, and also did not expect Morris to be the cat. Also, having been listening to the audiobook, I am probably going to say Morris instead of Maurice the entire way through because that is what I have heard for the past six hours. <laughs> Maurice, Maurice, I blame the French for the confusion. <laughs> Partially because it's easy, and also because Maurice is a French name. Is it? I did not know that. Published November 1st, 2001, and coming at 57,000 words, The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents is the 28th Discworld novel, the 5th standalone story, and the first in the series intentionally written for a YA audience. The initial concept of the Pied Piper scam was referenced in the book Reaper Man, where a character said the title of the story verbatim. The first line of this book, Rats, They Chased the Dogs and Bit the Cats, is a direct reference to Robert Browning's 1842 poem version of the Pied Piper of Hamelin, paraphrased to presumably omit the more violent language. The character of Dick Livingstone, who we don't actually meet in the story but is referenced a couple times, is a combination of two mayors of London, Richard Dick Whittington, who is said to have a cat that joined him on his folkloric journey from poverty to power, and Ken Livingstone, who was mayor when the story was published. The Amazing Maurice has been translated into over a dozen languages across 28 editions. The Hebrew translation won the 2014 Geffen Award, an honor slightly overshadowed by the fact that the book also won the 2001 Carnegie Medal. In 2003, the story was adapted into a radio play featuring David Tennant as the character Dangerous Beans. The unabridged audiobook, read by Stephen Briggs, lasts six and a half hours, with an abridged version read by Tony Robinson coming in at just over three hours. Stephen Briggs was also one of the two people to bring this story to the stage, the other being Matthew Holmes, who adapted it as a musical. In June 2019, Sky Cinema announced that an animated film adaptation was in development, starring Hugh Laurie as Maurice. Ooh. And actually, just a couple of months ago, they announced a couple other cast members, including David Tennant, mm -hmm. who is presumably reprising his role as Dangerous Beans. <laughs> we can only hope. So I have a question about that, because how are they going to do the accents? Because the Stephen Briggs audiobook has a really interesting range of accents for the rats, everything from like kind of traditional British to like Scottish, um, and a couple that I didn't recognize but didn't sound European. And so I really wonder how they're going to standardize the accents, or if they will, or they'll just keep that diversity um, within within the animated version. I couldn't begin to guess, although I would assume that the accents in the audiobook are more to just make the characters distinct from each other when it's one person reading the whole thing. It was. And they would just rely on the different actors having different voices. Yeah, it was just very startlingly <laughs> distinct how what like what a range of accents they picked for the rats and I kind of want to see them do that again like on the on the animated version. <laughs> that would be very fun. Yeah. Time will tell. 
Assuming that it does get made. <laughs> Ugh, I hope so. The story begins on a dirt road in the country of Überwald, where a mail carriage is stopped by a highwayman. He investigates the carriage to find one occupant, a stupid-looking boy with a cat. But when he threatens the boy, the highwayman finds himself swarmed by rats and is summarily driven away into the forest. The rats and the cat are actually sentient and capable of speech. The rats used to, to live near the magical Unseen University and were mutated after they ate its trash. Nobody is entirely clear on how the same thing happened to the cat, Maurice, but I'm sure that won't come up. <laughs> no, I'll just continue to wonder. <laughs> Maurice, the stupid-looking kid, and the educated rodents, who also refer to themselves as changelings and the clan, make their way to the town of Bad Blintz, where they prepare to enact their con. It's a simple scam. The rats sneak around through the town, causing enough of a disturbance that the, the townspeople demand the local government hire a piper, the stupid-looking kid, to lead the rats away. Maurice handles the negotiations by speaking for the kid, since nobody would assume that a cat is talking. We do meet a few of the clan. It's implied to be several dozen, if not hundreds, of rats. But the few that we tend to focus on include... Uh, Peaches, who is creative and helpful to the other high-up rats. Dangerous Beans, who is sort of a soothsayer and wise man to the clan. Dark Tan, who organizes them as they fake the plague and is in charge of disarming traps. And Hammond Pork, the elderly, ostensible leader, who's grappling with how decrepit and ancient he is at the ripe old age of three. <laughs> I feel that. These names make so much more sense when you're reading them compared to hearing them for the first time on an audiobook and trying to parse where they might have picked them up from. Yeah. <laughs> the only one that I kind of struggle with still is Dark Tan. And I don't know if I'm just like missing something. Hair dye, maybe? I feel like this might be one of those culturally relevant yeah. references where like as Americans, we don't have as much insight into what mm -hmm. product that yeah. could have come from. My money is on some sort of like uh, suntan lotion. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. But hopefully that's not one they're eating. <laughs> I, I just enjoy ham and pork since that's two kinds of pig. <laughs> My question is what what can have the word dangerous right? beans on it <laughs> back to back, you know? Th those aren't normally used mm -hmm. in labels. I think it will remain forever a mystery. <laughs> it has a very 90s feel to it, though. It does. <laughs> As the changelings scurry into the tunnels below the city, Dark Ten points out that this place is practically tailor-made for rats, which is concerning because there seem to be no other rats around. Up on the surface, Maurice and the stupid-looking kid are investigating the town, which seems to be in the throes of a rat plague already, judging by how paranoid people are about rodents. The two of them have a brief encounter with the local rat catchers, before they are discovered by a girl named Melissa. I just thought that was a really weird pronunciation of Melissa. Like a storybook <laughs> heroine where it's spelled very uniquely, and then looking at the show notes, it's like, oh, that makes so much more sense. Because <laughs> it looks like it's supposed to be some sort of Alice in there. Yeah, or like <laughs> Melissa, like, mal like, like Malice, but turned into a girl's name. It seems to be tradition for that family to give the women, like, horrible names. Thoroughly ominous names. <laughs> yes, ominous names. Melissa, it turns out, is the mayor's daughter and a descendant of the Discworld equivalent to the Brothers Grimm, the Sisters Grimm here, and she has an obsession with fitting real life into narrative tropes. She was uh, a bit insufferable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I'm going to be honest. But I feel like because she is a kid and we don't necessarily spend like a whole lot of time with her, I feel like it kind of works to help ground the story because I think it might feel super, super fantastical. And something about her always trying to find the story makes it a very apparent that like what is very story-like in the book and what is not. My theory on Melissa is that she is kind of a self-deprecating self-insert of Terry Pratchett particularly how he believes in the power of stories and relies on his audience understanding how they work. But that might be pure projection, since I see a lot of myself in her. 
I could see that. He does do a lot with telling a story is what makes it powerful. Yeah. And I feel like, especially because she is so young, it makes a lot of sense as a character trait since a lot of kids do try to find the logic in the world that may or may not be there. And so if you grow up hearing fairy tales and particularly like the Grimm story kind of fairy tales, I think it makes a lot of sense to latch onto those for any sort of lifeline you can get. Did we ever get given an exact age or age range for for the kid and Malicia? I don't think so. I think that they are probably around the 10 years old point, maybe 12. Yeah, my brain sort of hit more around like 12, 13-ish because of, of some of the choices they made and some of the ways they thought about the choices towards the end of the story. Back with the rats, as Ham and Pork struggles emotionally with the prospect of losing his position as the leader, Dangerous Beans and Peaches spend some time talking about their future plans to sail off to an island and form a rat society. This is also where we see that since not all of the rats among the clan are good with human letters, Peaches has been developing rat hieroglyphics. Which I'm sorry, Rachel, that you had to miss out on that from the audiobook. <laughs> they described them, actually, very detailed. Ooh, really? Yes. What an interesting way to handle that. I mean, I don't know how else you would. Yeah. <laughs> it was completely worth not being able to see the hieroglyphics in exchange for getting to listen to the narrator figure out how to pronounce the rat swear words. <laughs> 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 they were glorious. We also see that the rats have something of a holy book. Mr. Bunsey has an adventure, which is based heavily on the works of Beatrix Potter. Each chapter of the story has an epigraph that is an excerpt from Mr. Bunsey, although we never get to see the full book. Which brings me to an interesting thing. This book has chapters. We haven't seen those in a Discworld novel since, I think, Pyramids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There aren't very many, I think, that he did with chapters. I think it's almost exclusively the young adult ones, since apparently his publisher insisted on that, <laughs> according to something I remember reading and have no idea where it is. So, you know, <laughs> citation needed. Yep. That's a very interesting shift that happens, because I've been reading far more, like, adult literature than YA literature over the past, like, couple years. And it's weird to realize that they're not chapters in books anymore. Hmm. Yeah. The other rats are exploring the town, disarming traps wherever they can, which is tricky because despite how few rats they've actually encountered, the tunnels are crammed full of traps. Uh, this is also where we meet a juvenile rat named Nourishing, who it seems is exceptionally nervous. She's so sweetie. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly love that name and kind of want to name a cat that now, which has some <laughs> irony there. <laughs> yeah, although then people would kind of assume that you're planning on eating the cat. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> but it would let me vet who the right people are who recognize mm. exactly where it comes from. Yeah. <laughs> the litmus test. I don't feel like there are a lot of YA books or books for kids in general that really are able to evoke a sense of danger for the characters. Like it always feels a bit shallow. Like things are going to work out because it's a book with people under the age of 18 in it and it just kind of has to. But there was definitely a real sense of danger once the traps were introduced that I think works really really well in the story. And it was interesting how normalized it was too for the characters. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like oh god a sudden danger we've never encountered before how do we adapt to it? It's like okay same old threat same old peril same thing mm -hmm. we normally deal with just what on earth why is there so much of it? And so it kind of flushed out the background of the characters and the setting they live in a little more than I expected to get. Yeah. And of course, it all makes sense, right? Because they're rats in a human settlement. They're accustomed to traps. I would actually wonder, Liz, about your point with how much danger or how dangerous it feels, if that still applies in the post-Hunger Games era of YA fiction. Yeah, um, I think it's definitely kind of made a shift. And I definitely, like, I'm not saying that there are no books uh, for younger audiences that don't actually have real dangers to them because Hunger Games is a great example and the I never remember the name of the series but the books with the vampire assistant I know like there are multiple characters who do die in that as well and that is definitely targeted at a much younger audience uh, but I feel like in general a lot of authors tend to shy away from it because I think there's still the sense that kids are not going to know how to handle danger and death so you can't expose them to it 
Except for the author of the Animorphs, who just threw that out the window. <laughs> yeah. <I> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what makes this unique is that series like The Hunger Games are based on mostly human characters, and they're obviously like an inherently fraught setting from the beginning, and so you kind of know what you're going into when you read the synopsis on the back. But this one is about cute and cuddly things. It's about talking mice and talking cats and children who like to play flutes. And it, it's kind of a contrast of, like, the fuzzy anthropomorphic animal characters with a level of serious issues that you don't normally see in that setting. But it's removed from, like, the grimdark mentality that sets you up to contextualize a lot of that in current YA. Yeah. Back with Maurice, Melissa, and the stupid-looking kid, whose name we now learn is Keith, we learn a little bit more about the town's situation. Although it seems that Melissa is very prone to making things up, so it's difficult to be certain how much to believe of what she said. But during their conversation, one of the rats arrives. This particular rat, Sardines, has the theater in his soul, and he starts doing an elaborate dance routine before rushing away from Melissa and getting himself stuck in a trap. When Keith rescues him, Melissa quickly figures out the scam and decides that they should investigate the rat catchers. Sardines is very fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, especially because Ham and Pork and Dark Tan re represent this very serious side of the rats, Sardines is a, a nice little bit of joy for them. I don't know if they ever described in detail what his hat looks like, but I always imagine it being one of those boaters with a ribbon. <laughs> I think they do say it's made of straw, so that might work. Oh, perfect. <laughs> also, what do you think of Keith as a character? It seemed like at first he was just a placeholder to give the, the rats and Maurice something to, to act around, and I was really pleased to see how much he got fleshed out as the book went on. Yeah, he definitely seems like he's going to be kind of one of those self-insert characters that has no real distinguishing fe features at all. I like that that's kind of the point that you're supposed to make that assumption, and the longer you spend in the book, the more that he gets to show who he really is, both to the reader and and to Maurice and the rats. And that just because you're not always the action hero doesn't mean you don't have value or you don't do or know interesting things. Yeah. Uh, we get a scene here where one rat got caught in a trap, causing the others to contemplate mortality and the nature of existence, and the being they call the Bone Rat. Uh, this seems like a good place to discuss the Discworld interpretation of sentience, because it seems to come down to anthropomorphization. The rat behavior most closely associated with their new intelligence seems to be the way they think like humans, contemplating life after death and such. Uh, I find myself torn between wishing that the rats had developed into a more non-human society and respecting Pratchett for using this as an opportunity to present complicated concepts in a way that much younger readers can really identify with or get into. I think a lot of the Discworld sentience, it is anthropomorphic, but it's it's Terry using the way that changes the way you look at the animals or the creatures or the things that are talking to, to change your frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And I would also completely love a, you know, rat society, rat cognition based story. But I think that's something that like Jeff Vandermeer would be more suited to write. I think this fits <laughs> really well within P. Terry's within the style of writing and the style of commentary through his writing that he brings to everything he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this is definitely one of the stronger points in the book, because like I was saying, I do think a lot of books intended for younger audiences shy away from these heavy concepts and having to watch characters discuss what they think death might be like is a really serious thing that I know if I was like a 12 or 13 year old reading this would definitely get my mind going with questions and trying to understand what I thought about it. And and also the flip side of that is what does it mean to be a person or in this sense, what does it mean to be a rat? You know, that that introduction to the, the softball concepts of like personhood and identity and, and morality and that type of philosophy also comes through with this anthropomorphism as you follow them through their own exploration. And it isn't like there's no uh, emphatically rat aspects to them. For example, the rat hieroglyphs are very much something that is intended to be uh, for rats of rats, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, Discworld as a whole exists to be a parody foundation, 
So this is very much parodying stories where animals are just humans with weird heads, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, they did. he did keep a number of things that are ratty that I like. You know, the constant fixation on whittling on things. And, and not that whittling on things was inherently bad, but like when it was culturally appropriate versus when it wasn't and what context it should be used in. He didn't get into like, ew, whittling on things is gross. It was like, this is a normal rat thing. But man, we have to think about like how and when and where. Back with Maurice and the humans, they poke around in the rat catcher's office and discover a secret trap door leading to a network of cellars where the rat catchers are hoarding food and other sundries that they have been stealing and blaming on the rats. Now this is also where Keith mentions that he might look stupid but he really isn't. He's just quiet and has simple ambitions. Uh, following this reveal the, his character seems to change so that he talks more. Part of me is like it's less of an arc and more like a gear shifting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you two felt the same way. It also felt like maybe this was a situation where he finally had a reason to speak up. You know, previously, Maurice was running the show to a degree that he was like, uh, or could have been like, I, okay, I'm just here, I just do these things that you tell me because there was a strong personality leading him. But being put into situations with Melissa, suddenly he has to stand up for himself and has to kind of come into his own more. Um, so it, it could just be a situational change, but it was a pretty drastic contrast. Yeah, it kind of feels like at this point in the book, it's like somebody unlocked a door and now we get to see another part of Keith. And on one hand, I appreciate that because I think it does sell the point that just because you make an assumption about somebody doesn't mean that that's the correct assumption. And I think it has the added benefit of giving us a main character that is really just helping to support other characters' goals and ambitions. And, of course, it was foreshadowed that there's more to Keith than there seems at first, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There was a comment that he made early on in the story, and Maurice reacted to it as just like, I wonder if this kid is as dumb as he looks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just then, the rat catchers find Keith and Melissa in their cellar and prove themselves to be much smarter and more cruel than either of the kids expected. They knock the two of them out and leave them tied up in the cellar. But Maurice notices that something seems to be thinking at the rat catchers loud enough for him to hear it. Something deep down within the cellar system. <laughs> Several of the rats also made their way into the lair of the rat catchers, and the catchers recognize that ham and pork is an exceptionally strong and vicious specimen. So they stuff him into a sack and bring him to the secret rat fighting ring to face off against a dog. Yeah, this is definitely a very narratively intense moment. And it was like, oh no, I'm not really sure how Heaven Fork's going to get out of this. That strange voice notices Maurice and sends several non-intelligent rats to attack him, which he evades by running down into the sewers. It turns out that there are, in fact, plenty of rats in this town. They're just being puppeteered by something. There's a fairly extensive sequence of Maurice evading the, the rats and everything. And what's great about it is, like, the problem-solving he uses and sort of the how do I think about what someone else knows and understands. That theory of mind gets explored a little bit there. Yeah. And especially because at this point, we don't really know what the threat is having to watch a character try to outthink something they don't yet know is very, very interesting. Back with the clan, Dangerous Beans is distraught because when the, the changelings encountered that frightening presence in the sewers, they panicked and behaved ra like rats instead of acting intelligently. And it has shaken his confidence in what changelings can be. This bit seemed a little maudlin to me. I know I know where they're going with it and the idea that, you know, he really has placed all of his faith into this change and into them growing and being better than they could have been. But it also was sort of like, you've just encountered something completely novel, maybe. Cut them a little slack and figure it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, I don't think he realizes that panicking and running is something that humans do all the time when we encounter very weird, strange things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Al almost everything has a fear response like that, especially a startle response. You know, there are big animals out there that will still panic and run away. 
um, if you catch them when they don't know what's going on or they don't know how to deal with something, it's 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 kind of universal. Yeah. yeah, I think it does have the added benefit of being able to express that the way that the rats are thinking about their future society is still very, very much in its infancy, you know? So they haven't really had to confront an issue like this that does make them scatter. And how are they supposed to react to that? And how can they handle something like that in the future? Um, and I think that if there was a theoretical sequel to this book, that would be something that they could spend a lot more time delving into and trying to understand and forgiving themselves for making that assumption. And, you know, it's interesting because it, it seems like this is really the first time they've ever encountered a situation where the changelings act on instinct. Um, and even if it's a fear instinct, you know, what does that say about the way they've been behaving as rats? Did, did this really change them so much they have no instincts left that override them? Um, we hear a lot about Maurice fighting with his instincts after he's changed, but it seems like, you know, for the rats, Dangerous Beans is really expecting them to be completely above and beyond that now. And I think there's something to be said about how the guiding document for his conception of them is a Beatrix Potter story, so nobody there really acts like an animal. True. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partially the point, you know, expressing that they are holding this very, very simplified idea of the world in their mind. And the real world does not work like that. And, like, what's the timeline on how long it's been since they were changed? Like, mm -hmm. if a lifetime is three years for them, it, so, like, maybe this has just been a couple months at most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a real possibility because it is very, very vague. There was something towards the end of the book that corroborated that, and I can't remember exactly what it was. But it was it was something to do with with Maurice and how long he'd been fighting back instinct and how long he'd been trying to be this changed animal, um, and that did sort of put the timeline on it being a very recent change for them. So Dark Tan, Nourishing, Sardines, and several other rats decide to rescue Ham and Pork from the fighting pit. As the rest of the rats leave, Maurice has a confession for Peaches and Dangerous Beans. Uh, his intelligence comes from having eaten one of the changelings. To his shock, they accept his apology and don't seem particularly bothered by it. I mean, at that point, they kind of have figured it out. There's not really a lot of other options, right? No, no, there is not. Back with Hammond Pork, he finds new respect for the gift of intelligence when he realizes that the non-sentient rats in the pit could have overpowered the dog by working together. He is gravely wounded by the terrier, but rescued by Dark Tan, who has fashioned a bungee cord out of rubber bands and rescues Ham and Pork from the pit. <laughs> <That's> very cool. <laughs> Just yoink. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm sorry. This is this is a children's book, and yet we're we're talking about rats biting biting very sensitive parts of of other animals. <laughs> Just like yes. how is that a children's book? <laughs> Although, I don't know, I've seen a ton of children's movies that involve a lot of impacts to that area. Yes, but it's a little bit different when it's like an explicit fight scene detailing how a rat is specifically targeting. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. I don't know if either of you are aware. Uh, at the very end of the book, the author's notes, uh, Pratchett does say that, you know, a rat biting a dog's sensitive bits is supposedly a thing that actually has happened according to somebody he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I would believe it. Yeah, it seems very, very reasonable. Now, whether it was intentional. <laughs> in the following excitement, Dark Tan runs into a hole in the wall and gets himself caught in a trap. Yeah, reading this, my heart just like sunk. I was like, oh no, you know, things were going so good and now... You know, it's gone so terribly bad. Yeah, it was a hard part of the audiobook, too. Yeah. <laughs> Maurice, Peaches, and Dangerous Beans find where the rat catchers left Keith and Militia and cut them out of their ropes. Militia ends up shattering Dangerous Beans' wounded worldview when she derides Mr. Bunsey as a book for little kids. The two rats wander, heartbroken, back down into the sewers. Do you know what I think? 
we were talking a little bit about dangerous beings kind of overreacting to any sort of challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe he has ADHD and this is rejection sensitivity. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, those are a possibility, especially because, like, you know, he's really latched on to this idea and now he's being chastised for it and by somebody who doesn't even realize how much they're hurting him. Also, just like, come on, Melissa, the first thing you learn as a writer is that being a jerk about other people's writing, even if it's not the type you enjoy reading, is really not, like, a cool thing to do. But but sure, just drag on these books, Miss I Want to Be an Author. <laughs> yeah. I think with her, it's kind of less that she wants to be an author and more that she wants to be a character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She is the character in all of, everyone's story, not just her own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, like, She's 12, right? Mm -hmm. Kids can be jerks. (laughs) Yes. But yeah, she also might be neurodivergent. And it is the longstanding stance of this podcast that there are no neurotypical Discworld characters. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I can work with that. So when the rat catchers return, they pour themselves a cup of tea and Melissa reveals that she poisoned it extracting confessions out of the two of them before locking them in a cellar. She reveals to Keith that she actually just gave the two of them laxatives. The rat catchers also mentioned that they created a rat king, but Melissa is somewhat dismissive of it. She's dismissive of a lot of things. Yeah. (laughs) Sure, take the one thing that's part of, like, big narrative stories, and when something, when it finally shows up, be like, oh, no, that doesn't fit my story. I've built a story over here. This huge, this huge story point, totally irrelevant. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it turns out that Darktan survived the trap, and Nourishing manages to disable it to rescue him. The two of them return to the clan, where she tells the others how he died and came back to life. Dark Ten is uncomfortable with his new messianic role, but Sardines points out that the changelings are desperate for something to believe in, since Hammondpork is about to die. With his passing, he makes Dark Ten the new leader of the clan. I appreciate this, like, uh, growth in character for Nourishing, because at the start of the book, it is implied that she's a that she lacks the perspective that some of the older rats do, and her and Dark Tan but heads because of it. And I appreciate that, you know, she's the one who gets to save Dark Tan, showing that even though, you know, she's not somehow magically become good at fixing traps, but she does know how to still think on her feet and find a solution. Yeah, she started off the book as sort of the, the wimpy kid who gets bullied for wanting to try to, you know, hang with the big kids, basically. And it's nice to show that you know, you don't have to suddenly be amazing at everything to have value or be welcomed. You can still be yourself and struggle with whatever your personal struggles are, and you'll mm-hmm. still find your place and you'll still be important and accepted. You just have to overcome, like, your own internal hesitance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's made very clear that she struggles with performance anxiety more than anything. Mm-hmm. But when the chips were down, she kept her head. And she didn't solve the problem the way Dark Tan would have, but she found a solution. Mm-hmm. Maurice makes his way into the sewers, looking for peaches and dangerous beans, when the three of them are confronted by the Rat King's army. The king itself appears, eight blind rats with their tails knotted together, and it reveals its plan. When the Rat Piper comes... As per the story, the rats will all run into the river and presumably drown. But the story was written by someone who didn't know that rats can swim. And the king is going to send dozens upon dozens of rats out into the world, each infected with a bit of its own mind. And through them, it will be able to psychically dominate all the Discworld. And this was when I was like, wait, I thought I was reading a Terry Pratchett book. How did I end up in the Magnus archives? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a really, like, dark and intense moment and really forces you to confront some very uncomfortable things about, unfortunately, humanity and also what this rat is trying to do. And it really does seem to sort of embody the fear of rats, but the fear of rats as created by humanity, that that distilled dread of plague bearers and, and these things that are vile rather than what we've been shown rats can be throughout the story. 
And also, I do want to point out that Eldritch Horrors and Cosmic Monstrosities have been part of the Discworld from book one. Oh yeah, it's it's just the fear contagion bit that got me. <laughs> yeah, actually, speaking of that, this is a, a kind of subtle, but it's a callback to one of the first things we learned about the Discworld, is that the number eight is the most magically powerful number here, because the Rat King is formed of eight rats. Yeah. I totally spaced on that, but that feels important. When they were discussing the rat kings that Melissa had heard of, she said there were eight, there were ten, there was one made of eight, one made of ten, and one made of thirty-two. And it's interesting that of the two that have factors, I think thirty-two has a factor of eight, I don't know. It's a multiple. The ten just sort of stands out there, because you'd think like the bigger ones would be more powerful, but no, it's this, it's this king of eight that is controlling the story here also just it's relevant that while Melissa assumes that a rat king is something that occurs naturally as a result of rats being filthy this is actually a human construction the result of people letting their ambition blind them to the autonomy of living things mm -hmm. and also getting basic animal life and habits wrong <laughs> yes mm -hmm. yeah i feel like a lot of the negative parts about the rat king and rats in this section are really just reflections of the ills of humanity. We knew Pratchett went hard on the commentary, but in his children's book, this is a lot, man. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the king offers dangerous beings the opportunity to join with it and be part of its new kingdom. But Beans recognizes that the king doesn't think about the rats under its control as anything other than pawns, and he refuses. He has realized that even if the changelings aren't purely creatures of intellect, they still have the power to decide their own way through life. Meanwhile, Maurice, who is being mentally exhausted by the Rat King's psychic assault, retreats into primal cattliness and attacks the Rat King. With some help from Beans, he cuts through the King's tail knot, destroying its mind, but both of them suffer mortal wounds in the process. The death of rats comes for dangerous Beans. And death arrives to calculate how many lives Maurice has left of his nine. But Maurice insists on donating one of his remaining nine lives to the rat, which leaves death simply amazed. With that, both Maurice and Dangerous Beans return to the clan. This is a nice little bit that made the book feel very discordly, because I was like, all right, death loves cats. And I also had the realization that he probably loves cats because they have nine lives, so he gets to see them a lot. Or you know, maybe the other way around, the cats have nine lives because death makes an exception <laughs> for them. Yeah, both of those are great. <laughs> I, I just really like the part where Maurice in his prime catliness is like, ooh, another rat, and jumps on the death of rats. Because, you know, <laughs> it doesn't even matter that it's death. It's still a squeaky thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think Maurice is very lucky that death himself interfered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When I first read this book, part of me was kind of wishing that the Death of Rats had a, a bigger role in the story. But at the same time, it could have easily devolved into pandering, and we've already gotten so much of that with the librarian. I feel like in an adult novel, it would have been really cool to have more of the Death of Rats, because we recognize that character and we know a lot about it. I think for, for kids who don't have that background, also just going down that, that storyline would have been a little bit jarring and disjointed. And I feel like we do get some like glimpses of the death of rats through the bone rat um, and how the rats trying to understand death it does kind of reflect that this actual death of rats. I always assumed that they were talking about a bone rat because they had seen the death of rats, you know, and it was it wasn't just a myth they'd made up. It was it was literally a, a cryptid sighting, basically. Yeah, that is quite possible. And it could also just be the way that Discworld stories just sort of permeate consciousness. Yeah, you, you may not have heard of the death of rats, but because the concept of the death of rats exists, once you start thinking about death as a rat, it will become the shape of your mind. But we're not done yet. The official Piper has arrived, and is going to musically lead the rats out of town. When Keith ends up challenging him to a musical duel during which the changelings prevent the normal rats from fleeing and stuff cotton in their ears. The piper acknowledges Keith as the winner and hands over his magic pipe, which is revealed to just have a little switch that makes the sound high enough to irritate rats. The fact that rats can swim isn't a problem for him, since it means the piper has a steady source of work. 
Yeah, this feels like a, a, a moment where the magic breaks a little bit, but it breaks in a really interesting way, especially after having dealt with the actual magic of the Rat King. Yeah, and it was interesting because the humans in the story had built the Piper up to be such a malicious presence um, that it, it was interesting to see that he was like, no, it's just marketing, man. You know, I'm not actually, I'm just doing this to make sure I get paid as opposed to like an actual behavioral pattern that, that he'd really been promoting, which again, I guess speaks to, you know, the way stories propagate and grow and how much reality is based on who's telling it. I don't know how familiar you two are with the original story of the Pied Piper. Not really. I don't know if I've actually ever heard it. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so the way that that story goes, the Piper leads the rats out of town and into the river, but the townspeople refuse to pay him, so he leads all of the children out of town to the same fate. Oh, he drowns them all. Oh. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or at least leads them out of town to never be seen again. Okay. So. With the official Piper gone, Maurice and the rats demand a meeting with the mayor and reveal a new proposal. The town will be transformed into a place where humans and rats live in more or less harmony, which will bring in a lot of tourist revenue, reduce the level of non-sentient vermin, and give everybody a better standard of living. A peek behind the curtain. Uh, the first time I read this book, we had already started doing the podcast, and I decided to leave the ending as a surprise for myself, so I had no idea that this was coming. Now, having finally finished, I really like how it takes this nuanced approach to the idea of happily ever after as something that people work to make mm -hmm. without diminishing or denouncing it. And I think it's a really nice uh, counterpoint to the rat's idea of the island, you know? where the island was ba built entirely on the fantasy of Mr. Bunsey. And now that they've actually had to confront the real world and their place in it, they are, they're finding a new kind of paradise for themselves. And there's a nice parallel in it, too, um, when, they, when they talk about dealing with the Piper and the fact that, you know, the way you resolve is, is that every, nobody feels like they lose. And that, you know, maybe there isn't ever an ideal solution, but you can work something out where people at least feel like they've all gotten something. And then you see that then immediately become reality with what the rats have to figure out for their own life. So looking at the same philosophical concept, both in how they solve external problems and then how they reframe their worldview. So, Keith takes on a new title as the town's official musician, and he agrees to go on a date with Melissa. The changelings and the humans get to work building their new town, including street signs that include the glyphs that Peaches invented. And Maurice steals away into the night, where he finds another stupid-looking kid and sets up to pull a Puss in Boots scam. And, more or less, they all live happily ever after. So, what'd you think? It was a satisfying story. I mean, I mostly listened to it during long drives, and so it was especially with a lot of the harder stuff that I've been reading lately, it was nice to just sort of have not a not an easy story, but a simple story, one that made you made you feel good to listen to, even if it dealt with hard topics, to sort of just immerse myself in. Yeah, I very, very much get that feeling because while I very much appreciate this that this book doesn't shy away from those hard to talk about things, like what is death and how do you confront it and you know, changing of power and learning how to be a person. It is still a kid's story and it's very fun and it's got a nice balance of humor and joy in it. And it was a, a really, really nice, satisfying read. And this might be blasphemous to say on this podcast, but I kind of enjoy hearing T. P. Terry's right style and voice in a, a not-so-Discworld-specific story. I really like a lot of the Discworld writing, but this sort of is, is, a very, is adjacent, but a different style. And it was kind of a nice way to experience the author's persona through their work in, in a parallel way. Yeah, because it does take place on the Discworld, but it's not part of any of the established series, right? Yeah. But it's not a Discworld TM novel, you know, in style or in pacing. That actually brings me to a point I wanted to ask you two about is how does this feel different from the other Discworld novels? And we've kind of already covered that. Mm -hmm. But 
this did feel to me a lot like just a normal Discworld story. The only real difference is being numbered chapters and total absence of swears. It had rat swears. We have to remember the rat swears. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it felt subtler than a lot of the Discworld. I feel like in the adult novels with the social and societal commentary, Terry just kind of baps you over the head with it repeatedly with a frying pan to get his point through sometimes. And with this, a lot of the concepts being explored are a little more subtle. I mean, which makes sense for a, a kid's audience, but it was also a little bit easier to read because I'm not going to, like, stop and think about that comment you just made before I have to, like, re-immerse myself in the story, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the same time, it's kind of weird that the young adult book is a little bit subtler than the uh, ones attended, <laughs> intended for adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, adults have to face it, damn it. <laughs> I think there and I think there is a little bit less of like self-referential stuff in this one. So while it is a Discworld book because it does take place in the Discworld and there are characters that do come through from other points in the series like Death and the Death of Rats, it kind of feels more like they're just like, yeah, 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 it's part of that thing. But you don't need to worry about knowing everything else. Yeah, you're much more able to enjoy this one without as much context. It is worth pointing out, actually, that the two officers of the town watch, their names are direct translations of colon and knob. Oh. (laughs) So this is their equivalent of two of the characters from the watch books. Uh, One section near the end particularly stuck out to me. Uh, There are multiple paragraphs describing how... Once the new town is built, people come from all over to see it and admire how the humans and rats get along and how amazing it all is. Uh, The quote, And then most of them go back to their own towns and set their traps and put down their poisons, because some minds you couldn't change with a hatchet. Mm -hmm. End quote. That resonated with me, because I have definitely seen that Mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. Yeah, it is very, very, very real, unfortunately. And I think it's a a good message to express to kids that, you know, somebody might say and do things at one moment and then contradict those things a moment later. It also just feels highly relevant given, you know, 2021 versus when it was written. It's like, (laughs) that's so much more of our lives now. We have to confront it more often because we're a lot more interconnected. Mm -hmm. So one thing I will say regarding this as a children's book I know we're used to children's books now being violent, but it's a little bit gory and a little bit, uh, it's, it's surprising to me as something that is written as a children's book that it is as explicitly violent in some ways that it is, um, compared to like, I grew up on Redwall and those are Mm. obviously pretty violent series too. And this felt to me a little bit more graphic. I don't know if that's the haze of memory or if it's just, you know, animals are animals and things happen to animals that are sometimes not pretty and he's going to look that in the face too. Possibly. I also did enjoy the Redwall books, but I don't remember very much of them. They were really violent. (laughs) Oh my (laughs) god. (laughs) For each one, I try and delve a little bit into what I perceive as the thesis of the story. Okay. Uh, here, there are two themes of this book. Uh, the minor one, and this is a, a theme of the entire series, is narrative as a source of identity. Like It's explicitly stated by Melissa, if you don't make your life a story, you become part of someone else's. And that's true. But we see how it can also be detrimental. Uh, her vision of herself as a storyteller has impaired her social skills, which also leads to her obliviously dismissing the story that Dangerous Beings has built up as the foundation for what he thinks Ratkind can become. Even Maurice has some elements of this, as he is caught between his retirement plan of dyeing his fur and living with some old lady, that and his cynical emphasis on self-preservation, and the guilt he feels about past transgressions against the clan that he kept secret from them for too long. But Keith has it figured out. He loves music and is satisfied with any circumstances that allow him to play freely. The message here seems to be that identity is a source of strength only up until it impairs your ability to adapt to the world around you. Yeah, so much of what makes the changelings different is that they do have a sense of self. That's like what sets them apart from other rats, from other animals you could make that extension by. So while 
some of their power does come from their intelligence. Some of their power also comes from their individual individuality, the sense of identity. The more major theme of this story is manipulation. Uh, Maurice manipulates the clan by leveraging his better understanding of human society. They and the rat catchers manipulate townspeople by faking a plague. Uh, the rat catchers themselves are manipulated by the rat king. Now, all sentient beings manipulate each other to some extent, right? If your definition is broad enough, you could say that I manipulated you two into being on the show by asking you to join me in discussing the book. <laughs> but what this story seems to be saying is that the unethical form of manipulation is the imposition of one will over that of another, whether that be through providing false or incomplete information, or simply by ignoring their capacity for agency. It is only through collaboration, when everyone is honest about their needs and works together on a solution, that the ultimate success is earned and the world becomes a better place. Yeah, and I think that's was the second half of the extension of the thought I had about the rats' real power coming from their sense of individual, their sense of individuality, um, is that the Rat King, by comparison, because you can make the argument that the Rat King is as equally intelligent as any of the rats, but where the Rat King fails is that it is one, it is a creature that is attempting to control other creatures rather than allowing them to control themselves. And how ultimately it's doomed to fail and it's just a source of pain and fear and lacks the real, lacks the real capacity for growth and progress because it doesn't have, it doesn't allow for that sense of identity. Yeah, because collaboration can only happen between autonomous individuals in this through a sense of mutual respect, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Rat King does not allow other people to, like, have influence over it. And especially because so much of the moments in the book where the rats are saving each other from situations that they wouldn't be able to save themselves from, it's like if they were all separate beings who did not have any interest in each other and were just normal rats, none of them would have survived those situations. Rachel, any final thoughts you had? Not so much. Uh, Y'all have really eloquently kind of said everything that I would I would have contributed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hope I didn't steal your thunder. Oh, no. You have spent so much more time thinking about this than I have that I'd rather hear it in your words. <laughs> yeah. Listen, the Discworld series lives in my head rent-free 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> On loop, like, you know, elevator music, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I inflict a lot of talking about Discworld on people I know. They should just be grateful that I talk about anything else at any time. <laughs> <laughs> that about does it for this episode. So I want to say thank you to Willow Carter for our theme music and to all of our listeners for tuning in. And of course, a big thank you to my co-host, Liz, and our guest, Rachel. It was a joy to have you both on. Yeah, it was fun. And it was awesome to have you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was it was great to get to join. If you'd like to support the show, uh, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or share the episode links that we post on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Reddit, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel. And, you know, be sure to like, share, and subscribe and all that. Uh, you can also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash weirdsisterspodcast, where you can also get episode previews, and it puts you in the running for the patron shoutout. This month, we thank Robin for their continued support. Thanks, Robin. And of course, we run a poll each month to find out our audience's favorite footnote. It's hard to translate sir into rat. The rat word for sir isn't a word. It's a sort of momentary crouch indicating that just at the moment, the crouching rat is prepared to accept that the other rat is the boss, but the he or she shouldn't get funny about it. All right, join us again next month for the big one. That's right, it's Night Watch. Until then, the, the turtle, turtle moves. moves. <laughs> <laughs>